Hey everyone, my name is Quincy Davis and I am so excited about this lesson because I've got my good friend and colleague uh, who teaches with me at the University of North Texas, Stockton Helbing. Uh, I, I brought him in to, to kind of address some basic concepts and approaches to playing big band drumming per your request. See, I listen to you guys. I read all the comments and I appreciate it. Um, and this guy, he has a plethora of experience playing with big bands. Of course, not limited to big bands, but some of the big bands he's played with, of course, is the famed One O'Clock at the University of North Texas. He was in that for a couple of years. Um, he also played with Maynard Ferguson's big band um, and also Doc Severinsen's big band. You're going to see a couple of clips, clips of him playing after this. But And on top of all of that, he's the leader of eight CDs. Yes, eight CDs um, that he's put out over the last 10, 10 or so years. Um, and on those CDs, you'll hear his wonderful writing. He's a wonderful composer, arranger, and he's a, a great band leader. Uh, just an overall wonderful musician. And his latest CD, Light Sleepers, came out this year. So check that out. Um, you'll find it on all streaming platforms. I'll put all of his social media platform information down below. So make sure you follow him here on YouTube, Instagram, go to his website, um, he's just doing so many different things. You definitely want to check out his website because he's, he's got a lot of projects going on. As always, if you enjoy the content on my channel, please let me know and press the like button and subscribe because I put out weekly drum lessons that I know will be beneficial to you. So please consider subscribing. Okay, without further ado, here are four, yes, four big band basics with Stockton Helbing. The first thing we're going to talk about today is the importance and overriding necessity for anyone who wants to get into big band drumming to listen to big band drumming. Don't skip this step. You can read books about big band drumming. I've written one myself, but I can tell you that nothing is more valuable in the book I wrote than listening to a master big band drummer play. And we're talking about really listening, not like put it on while you're on your phone, like looking at stuff. We're talking about put some headphones on, close your eyes, and listen to it. My teacher, Ed Sof, used to say, if you want to learn something from a piece of music, you need to listen to it 100 times, and then you're ready for it to teach you something. Mm. Here is tip number two, which is do no harm. Do no harm. Right. I have no idea what he means, but we're going to find out. I mean, maybe to put it in simpler terms, don't make the band mad at you. You know what I mean? Or, or even, even better terms, don't get fired <laughs> off your big band gig. So here's what we have to do. We want to make sure that when we look at the chart that's given to us, we know how to properly identify the rhythms and articulations the band's going to play so that we place them in the best sounding parts of our drum set. To boil it down in the most simplest forms, if the band is playing a short sound, the snare drum is a great choice. If the band is playing a long sound, the snare drum is still a good choice, or the bass drum is a good choice. The toms are never a good choice for playing a band's figure. They are great for using for interconnecting figures with fills and setups, which we'll talk about soon. But do not play the band's figures on the toms, because one of two things happen. Either you just so happen to have a tom tuned at a pitch that works great with the chord the band's playing, in which case you can't hear it. It disappears. 
or more than likely, it harmonically clashes with the chord the band is playing, and then it just sounds muddy and indistinct. The snare drum and bass drum are harmonically sterile, so they work really great for figures. So a short figure in most swing charts, swing, medium, jazz type charts, means it's going to be an eighth note that is untied, and we'll play that on the snare drum. Everything else can sound good on the bass drum. So that would be a quarter note, half note, a longer sound. And so obviously we need to make sure as well that we play the proper rhythms that the band has and we play them on the proper voices. What I'm going to do right now is play two measures for you. It's measures two and three from etude number two from my big band book. I'm going to play a bar of time and then I'm going to play their figures on the appropriate voices. You'll note that in measure three, these figures are appearing above slash notation. We would refer to these as background figures or melody cues. The chart actually doesn't tell us which. So we want to recognize though that because they're happening over the top of slash notation, we're going to build these figures into our time field. And this is from your book, your big band yes, drumming book, Yes, right? this is from my big band book. Big Band Drum Set, Sight Reading Etudes, Volume 1. And this is the book that we use at the University of North Texas, and I highly recommend it. It's great for working on your reading, understanding styles, um, and just un understanding Big Band Drumming as on a whole. So there's just so much information on it. We just want to help everyone enjoy playing Big Band music as much as we do. Yeah. So here's Measures 2 and 3 from the Big Band book, and I'm going to play the band's background figures on the appropriate voices. One two measure two one two three four short long here it is again two three so i'm playing time and here's their figure and three so i play the snare drum on the end of one because it's short i played the bass drum on the downbeat of three because it's long and you'll notice that i maintained a good swinging ride cymbal feel throughout you'll also notice i did not over accent these figures just because we're playing a background or melody cue in a chart does not mean we're playing it at fortissimo yeah. volume. We want to build it inside of our comping and time field. And that's something that I, I, I hear a lot of drummers kind of, they kind of over, they do more harm than good. Mm. Let's, let's bring do it back to the tip. No, no harm. harm. In other words, they see this figure and they'll either play something that goes against it or they'll play it way stronger than it needs to be played, and it disrupts the flow of those slashes, which mm. is your time and pause and groove. We can't get in the way of that. So when it's above the staff like that, just build it, as Stockton said, build it into your time. Absolutely. The other type situation we'll more than likely encounter in a big band chart is when we see notation that's written in the very center of the staff. Sometimes it'll be written in a bit of a bizarre looking notational uh, interpretation. We call that rhythmic notation. You'll see on this example at uh, pickups to letter B, bar 9, that we see figures in the middle of the staff. We'll also note that the and of 4, and of 2, and and of 4, these are long sounds because the the ensemble is tying an eighth note to a quarter note. So I can look at it and already know that I want to play those with my bass drum. And to express them in a more connected way, I'm going to shoulder crash along with them. But I am not going to play time throughout because that's where I'm going to insert some setups in the next couple steps. Can you, uh, give them yes, sir. I'd be happy to. Here is the measure before letter B. A one, two, three, four. A one, two, three, four. Long, long. Or it's always okay, always okay to use a snare as well, especially if I feel like the band is getting a little bit shaky in their time feel. That snare drum gives them ultra clarity, and it can still sound long if I accompany it with a shoulder crash. Here's the same example. One, two, here's a bar of time. One, two, three, four, and, and, and. Now, Stockton, now I know you played it right, but it seems a little naked. Am I, am I crazy for thinking that? Not at all. Not at okay. all. We certainly hear that there's space to work with. There's negative space, as we would say if we were doing art, like painting. Uh, but we can't start setting the band up till we know how to play their figures with them and do no harm. But yes, absolutely. Let's move on to step three. <laughs> Tip number three 
is the that, that's my special effects. I, I'm hoping he'll throw some reverb I'll on that for me. The primary rhythmic setup. This is a simple way to help everyone feel comfortable starting to help prepare the ensemble. That sounds fancy. All you really want to think about is playing the downbeat before the band plays their figure on the opposite sound source, sterile sound source, from what you know you'll play with them. Let's look at pickups to letter B here. We have an and a four, an upbeat eighth note tied. We know from our earlier discussions that's more than likely going to sound excellent with a bass drum and shoulder crash on a cymbal. I'm going to look at the downbeat right before it, which is the downbeat of B, and I'm going to play my primary rhythmic setup right there on my snare drum. I'll show you what I mean. One, two, here we go. A one, two, three, four, and, and, and. I'll do that for you one more time. A one, two, here we go. A one, two, and three, and four. One, two, and four, and. I have a question. Yes, sir. Te yes. Teacher, I have a question. Yes, Professor Davis. <laughs> um, could you also play those figures on the snare drum? And if you did that, yes. how would that change your primary sound? Awesome story? question. Well, as we discussed earlier, the snare drum is always a good choice. And sometimes, if I feel like maybe the acoustics that I'm playing in of the concert hall or venue I'm in are of such where it's really getting hard to decipher time, I like to put the band's figures on a snare drum, but with the shoulder crash. So now I would place my primary rhythmic setup on the bass drum. Here's that example. One, two, here we go. A one, two, and three, and four. And, and, and. Also, very effective in building confidence and musical excellence with the band. That's, that's great. That really clears up a lot of confusion that I, personally I had. Hopefully it <laughs> helps you guys too. Good. Well, let's talk about our fourth step. Fourth step. Fourth we step. One more? We have one more in our big band basics, baby. Pro tip, basic, big band tip number four coming at you. Beautiful big band basic <laughs> tip. <laughs> We're going to talk about how we actually play the rest of a setup, Phil. We just went over the primary rhythmic setup. What you want to do is think about the primary rhythmic setup as the punctuation mark at the end of your whole setup, Phil. You don't want to change that. Once you've set it, you can start adding material before it. Now, this is going to be such an easy solution to make you sound good. You're going to be shocked at how easy it is. Mm. If you've ever heard of copy and paste, we're getting ready to do some drumistic copying and pasting. Let's hear some copy and paste. Let's do it. Well, let's look at that same example we've been analyzing. We're going pickups to letter B. So I am going to predetermine that I'm going to play there and of four of that measure with a cymbal and bass drum crash. So my primary rhythmic setup is the downbeat of four. So I'm going to copy it and paste it a couple times before then. Let's see how that sounds. A one, two, here we go. A one, two, three, and four. We can see that it's effective because we are playing with clarity for the band. But it's a little bland because no one wants to hear just quarter notes on the snare drum. How can we make that more exciting? Well, it's really simple. We've copy and pasted our rhythmic idea. Let's just explore different sound source options and see if that helps. So we're not changing the rhythm. We're just going to change the sound source. Here's the same example. A one, two, and here we go. A one. So that one was a little clever because I went around the drums and then I put my primary rhythmic setup on the snare, or I'm sorry, I put my primary ryth rhythmic setup on the bass drum and went to snare crashes. And you can see that that starts sounding very Mel Lewis-ish, very Sonny Payne-ish, and the possibilities are endless with quarter notes. That's already, it's, it sounds so much better, and it's so simple. It is. And I know you're going to add something even more, but sure. just that alone is good enough to really help the band feel their entrance. And that takes us back to our second bullet point of the day, do no harm. And then another great possibility that you could do, and this is very Mel Lewis-esque that I would like to point out, is look at what the band's going to do and just literally foreshadow it. So on this same example of measure eight, pickups to measure nine, I see an and of four on the bass drum with a crash. Mel might 
complement that by doing this. A one, two, three. So I played the end of one, end of two, end of three on the exact same place that I was going to play it. And then I interconnected those ideas in the first bar of B by leaving that primary rhythmic setup on the snare. Did you notice that? Two and three and four. And, and, and. And I added a little razzle dazzle with those toms by just playing another pickup note. One and two and three and four. And, and, and true to Mel Lewis form, I'm never getting myself crossed up and out of position. Mel always looks, quite frankly, like he could fall asleep at any moment. That's part of the magic with him because it was so smooth. And some people talked a lot about his nice horizontal motion. Um, but by foreshadowing literally and then playing simple setups, it's easy to sound excellent and give the band tremendous confidence. And then, as Quincy alluded to, you can always add a little more material. If you want some more ideas for big band fills, I did a video on big band big band fills. I so bet you could put a link to it, like right here if I point here. I Yeah, actually, it'll be more like up here. Okay, I can't wait to see. There. Did you just put that over my face? Yeah, up there. Uh, it looks better over my yeah. face anyway. So, please refer to that. But, at this point, um, I would love, to, and I, I know you guys would also love to hear you play through this whole chart. Sure. Um, and kind of just highlighting and, and showcasing all these different techniques and concepts and approaches um, that you spoke so eloquently. Oh, thank you. I would be happy to.